In my line of work, I deal with a lot of people with depression. Depression, anxiety, sadness overall. You know, it's, a, it's the disease of the century. People are going through some hard times and it feels like this is the worst time ever. Everyone is going through some challenges. And recently here in Australia, specifically in the Gold Coast in Queensland, the state where we live in, we have had some heavy rain, a season of heavy rain. It doesn't stop raining. I don't, it doesn't really feel like the Gold Coast, but a few people have had their houses devastated, lost their houses, and it's, you know, it's kind of a tragedy. And we feel bad and people are still going through trials. And I feel like, like I said, in my line of work, going through trials is a constant. We all going to face trials. As a matter of fact, this is the only promise that Jesus ever promised us, trials and tribulations. Now, every now and again, I, I come over here with the chance of sharing what we share as a community of faith, as a, as a family. And when I think that message is applied to, or is applicable to the other side of the screen, you there watching, I feel like it's an honor for me to be able to share with you. So today, I wanna share with you a passage in the Bible that encourages us to go through these trials in the Gospel of James. I like to call it the Gospel of James. I know it's controversial. A lot of people will go like, oh, that's not a Gospel, that's a letter. You know, it's the letter that James, Jesus' brother, wrote. And the first chapter is an amazing chapter. And it, most theologians will say that the Gospel of James or the letter of James is the equivalent of the book of Proverbs in the New Testament. You can read verse by verse or paragraph by paragraph and take a lesson out of each one of them. Uh, most of the writings in the New Testament, you would need to read the whole chapter, maybe a few chapters prior to it, a few chapters after to sort of understand the context, but not this one. The Gospel of James or the letter of James has teachings in every single verse. But I want to try to explore parts of chapter one to challenge this idea of trials. So I don't know if you um, have faith or not, and that doesn't really matter at this point. Just understand that this is an encouragement for me to you. So towards the end of your Bible, you can look a little bit before the book of Revelation and the other letters, you can find the letter of James. There are five chapters in it, and we are going to explore the first chapter. That's all we're going to do today. All right. This is what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion or diaspora. Greetings. What I think it's fascinating is that James doesn't count the fact that he's Jesus' brother as an advantage. He doesn't say, look, I'm his brother. You know, I, I know for a fact that if I was Jesus' brother, that would be my first line of advertising. Who are you? I'm, I'm his brother. <laughs> That's what I would say. But not James. James goes, I'm a servant. He learned to be a servant. Now, how many of us would be humble enough to say, I serve my brother. There's, there's, there's a lesson right there. And then he greets the churches and he says the churches of the dispersion uh, thousands of years ago, once the, the religion called Christianity started, a, a persecution sort of took place and then a lot of people were dispersed after this festival that they had. They, they went back to their cities with the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were all super excited and they started forming churches and groups and communities in these places. So this is who James is addressing. And to a certain degree, I think, I feel like this could be addressed to us. Because to a certain degree, we are a consequence of those churches. 2000 years ago, these guys went back to their cities, they started preaching. And then they started conquering, they started traveling, and there's a lot of stuff that happened in between, good and bad, and I don't want to get into it. But the gospel only came to us because someone one day decided to take a step further and take the good news of the gospel to a different location. So that could be applied to us. It's so practical, so up to date. So he goes on and says this, which I think it's one of the most difficult parts of this whole letter. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds or trials of any kind, I would, if I had the chance to meet James and James was telling me this right face to face, I would go, hold up, stop, stop. Before you say anything, what did you just say? Like count it all joy? 
when you face trials like this teach me how to do that and that will be enough I, I don't need anything else I don't need any other Bible verse just teach me that formula how do you count joy when you are facing trials I think James understood something that we are missing out on and this is the point of this whole conversation so he goes on and says for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and another word for steadfastness is patience so when your faith is tested you will develop patience now there might be a difficulty for you trying to find an explanation when it comes to theology for that part but i can tell you how your patience is developed when you are trialed kids <laughs> if you have kids man your faith has been tested because i'm sure you have like i have bow to your knees and say, God, I can't do this. I, gotta, I don't know how to manage this. What, how do I raise these kids, man? They are literally killing me. And um, that's, that's how your faith is tested. But I, I've got some good news for you. I have learned that a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. That's, <laughs> that's something for you to ponder. If your faith can't be tested, you can't be trusted. Look, um, you might not be able to see this, but we have a little stone here. And I, you know, I, I can sit on it because I've sat here so many times and I can test it. Therefore, I can trust it. I, I have another example and I, I, I wish I had the chance to bring a parachute. But he, think about this. If someone had told you, hey, we're going to go jump from a plane and you're going to be given a parachute, but that parachute has never been tested. It's never been opened, it's never been used. No one ever wore this parachute. Would you jump? Of course not. No one would, because something that can't be tested can't be trusted. That's why we test things. And here is the even better news. If God is testing your faith, it's because he's looking for someone to trust. And then someone might be you. So just consider yourself worthy of God's trustiness. Or trustiness? Trust? trustworthiness, whatever that is. Consider yourself lucky, blessed that God is testing your faith because He is actually telling you, I trust you, therefore I'm testing you. So maybe you will get stronger. And patience or steadfastness, or let patience have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you remember the Psalm 23, one of the most famous verses in the Bible? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything. The only way for you to lack nothing, to be complete, to be perfect, is to be tested in these areas where you think you lack. And the more you're tested, the more you will be, you will be trusted. And then patience, which is a fruit of the Spirit, by the way. So if you have the Spirit in you, you're supposed to develop patience. And how are you supposed to develop patience if you're never put in situations where you have to be patient? How are you supposed to become a patient person if you never have to wait in line? And I know we all hate lines. But how are you going to develop patience? How are you going to be a humble person if you're never put in situations where you're humbled? Now here, <laughs> this is going to hurt, but we're going to go there. It is much better to be humbled than to be humiliated. Humiliation takes a lot of effort to come out from. Now, when you're humbled, and, and <laughs> even better, if, if you're wise, if you're smart, you're, gonna, you're just gonna humble yourself. And that's the command, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you. If you're, if you're smart, you will humble yourself. You just, you just take a knee every time you make a mistake, every time you mess up, every time you screw up, every time there's a step back. You know, like the, the old saying, it's, it's, a, it's a minor step back for a major comeback. Just humble yourself and just surrender to the Lord. It's much better because if you have to wait until a heavy hand comes and humbles you, man, that hurts. It's the good old humble pie, you know. It tastes better the more you taste. <laughs> but you don't want to taste the humble pie, I tell you. I'm, I'm, like, like, should I tell you that story? Yeah, I, um, last Sunday we were at church and people were telling about their internship. We have an internship program in our church. And I was an intern once. I think I was Marshall, my, my pastor. I think I was his third intern. At the end of my internship, we, we, we have come to this conclusion. He said, I never want to do this again. <laughs> Either 
I was the worst intern ever, which people say that I was, and I, I'm happy with that. Or something was wrong with that guy. Now, fast forward 15 years, he's been doing that again constantly and constantly and helping so many people. I can only conclude that the problem was me. And I feel like my internship had never finished and never ended because it's a constant, it, it, it's constantly putting myself in a position to serve, to be patient, to be humbled. That's how you lack nothing. That's how you become perfect. So James continues and he goes on, he goes on and says this, verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom and he's referring to the challenges. So if you're under trial, if you've been trialed, if you're being tested and you lack wisdom in there, example, how do I raise my kids? How do I solve this problem? You ask God because God gives freely. He, he just ask God for wisdom and he will give you, but don't doubt. That's, that's the, that's the advice. Do not doubt, because if you doubt, you're going to be like a, like a, a wave in the ocean. So you, you're going to be lost. You're double-minded. And you're, a, the Bible says, James says, you're unstable in all your ways. Now, let me talk to the wives here for a second. If you're women and you're watching this and, and maybe you want to share it to some of your girlfriends, you don't want to marry, you don't want to marry a double-minded man. What you want is someone who's stable in all his ways. And that's not to say he'll never make a mistake, but you need someone who's stable because a double-minded man is dangerous. It's dangerous for your relationship. It's dangerous for your kids. It's dangerous for your future. You want a stable man. And a stable man is a man who trusts the Lord with all his heart, all his heart, not just a little bit of his heart, not just 10% of his heart, all his heart. Ooh, Asad, it feels like this is marriage council right there. <laughs> So um, verse 8, it says this, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, and its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in all of his pursuits. Have you ever watched that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith? It's one of my favorite movies. I feel like our society, we as human beings, we are constantly stuck, um, locked in this pursuit of happiness. But we have made this beautiful journey to pursue happiness. We've made this beautiful journey about material things. It's always about more, more, more. I want more. I want more. And the more you want, the more you have, the more you want, the less fulfilled you are. It's not in vain that a lot of rich people, a lot of well-off people, wealthy people are committing suicide. That's one of the reasons. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Because material things will never be able to fill the void that is only filled with God. It is because of the pursuit of money that many people have gotten lost. James said the same thing a little bit further in his letter. So I, I don't, I, I'm about to share a message on this. this. This is a life message. It's something that I've been working on and I think it's going to be echoing for years to come. If there is one pursuit that man should invest himself into, it's not the pursuit of happiness. It's the pursuit of holiness. But that's a different message. I don't think we're ready for that conversation right now. <laughs> Maybe next time. So verse 12, he says this. Blessed is the man. And here it comes again. James with his upside down, inside out ideas. And maybe he learned that from Jesus. Jesus was a master in doing this. You know, the sermon on the mountain where Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. If you are listening to that sermon, you go like this. What was say it again? Like, blessed are those who are poor. Say, oh, hold up, hold up. I got, are you sure, Jesus? You, you sure you don't got that twisted? Because it, it, it don't feel blessed. But that's, that's what James saying. Like, blessed is the man who remains patient under trial. You know what I feel like when I read this? I feel like just kicking everything. You know, like I... I said this in church when I was sharing this and people left and I think it was a nervous laugh because I said, I hate this part of the Bible. And they're like, what? Like, you can't say that, but I do. Like, honestly, when you're going through trials, it's virtually impossible to remain patient. You know, when you say like, I've had enough. I have found out in life, especially if you want to pursue holiness, if you want to get connected with God, I've found out that when you say you've had enough, God is just starting. And bro, that hurts. That hurts a lot. And I, I don't know how to go around it. I don't think there is a way around it. Because James is saying, 
you are blessed if you remain patient under trial. The reality is that the, the, the Greek text, the original one right here, doesn't have the word patient here. So James is saying, blessed is the one who remains under trial. In other words, a modern translation could say, you will be blessed if you don't rush out of your trials. If you don't try to solve it too quickly, you know, like, oh, I've got myself into, situ into this situation and, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I'm just putting it out there, right? Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a problem with kids. Maybe it's financial problems. I don't know. It doesn't really matter the nature of the problem. But you've gotten yourself into that trouble. Or maybe someone got yourself into that trouble and you're having to pay the price. Don't rush out. You will be blessed if you remain in there. Why? Because I've... <laughs> Let, let's just say this. Like, may, maybe this is disconnected, but get this. I um I I love books, okay. I, I love books. I'm a bookworm. I read a lot. I've got uh, I've been here in Australia for about a year. I think I've got 200 books laying in my house. 600 books that I left behind in Brazil. A lot of books that I gave away. Have I read them all? <laughs> Not at all. I haven't read a portion of it. But I keep buying books, and I can say that I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. That's knowledge, and that's not to boast, because that's not wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge put into practice. And I have found that knowledge needs time to work itself into wisdom. And time, time is what hurts. But time builds principles. That's the beautiful thing, principles. Because principles is what you develop to react to situations when they repeat themselves in your life. So next time you fall into the same kind of trouble, you already know how to react because you developed principles, because you were patient and you never rushed out out of trouble and you remained patient, trusting that God will give you the wisdom to solve that. You see, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a puzzle. Each paragraph will complete the next one. Uh, never say you attempted. That's, that's James saying. Never say, if you're going on a trial, don't confuse that trial with temptation because God doesn't tempt you. As a matter of fact, the text says that we, we are tempted by our own desires. We are lured into, we are enticed. Those are two very beautiful, fancy English words that I don't even know what they mean. But that's, the reality is like, we, let, me, let me just be clear. You don't need no devil in your life to tempt you. Like if the devil was taken out of the picture, right? Let's, let's just pretend like there's no devil in the world. If the devil was taken out of the picture, we can get ourselves in trouble all right. We can get ourselves in trouble because we are generally uh, selfish creatures. We, you know, James will teach us that too. We pray and we don't receive what we pray for because we pray wrong. We keep wishing for our own desires and our desires are the ones who put ourselves in trouble. So we don't need no devil to tempt us. We, we can tempt ourselves. We can fall out from God's favor just because we're selfish. That's why we need to remain in God. And that's why trials keep us humble, keep us on our knees, keep us telling God we can't do this by ourselves. And when that posture takes place in our lives, then you live a good life, a peaceful life, a shalom life. You know, Jesus used that expression, shalom, which means peace, but it's more than peace. It's just like, whew, everything is all right. You know, I keep going back to this Bob Marley song, everything is going to be all right. I think maybe I should preach about that, but if I, if I preach about Bob Marley in church, trust me, I'll be crucified. So let's just move on. Let's just agree to disagree. Um, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow of a doubt. No shadow of a doubt. I think this verse just... It's another way of saying to us, when God gives you a trial, there is a way out. There is a door. He will never give you something that you can't carry. And, and let me just erase that. As a matter of fact, He will give you, if He trusts you, He will give you something that you cannot carry. So you can rely on Him. You know, if He gives you something you can carry on your own, you don't need no God. You don't need no devil. You don't need no God. That's the, you know, He will give you something you can't carry so you can rely on Him. That's the difference between a trial and a temptation. Like if I can illustrate this, let's just, maybe I can put this on this side. Like a trial is like this. The offer in front of you will be stronger, greater than your flesh. Okay, that's a trial. You've been trialed. The offer is greater than your flesh. Now a temptation is like this. The offer 
is greater than your flesh. They look the same. A trial and a temptation, they kind of look the same in the beginning. The difference is your reaction to the offer. Because when you say, I can do this on my own, you, you, you think you're the man, you think you're Superman, you will fall into temptation and you will surrender to the desires of your flesh and that will bring consequences like sadness, remorse, sometimes death. But when you look at the situation and you go, you know what, I, I can't do this. This is too much. I, I can't handle it. Please help me. And then you humble yourself, remain on the trial, remain steadfast, patient, fruit of the Holy Spirit, give it to God, surrender to Him, He will pick it up. Maybe that's why Jesus said, you know, if you're tired, come to me, I'll give you rest. And obviously the context is different, but I think it applies. You're applied, you, you, you're tried, you, you, and you're so hard, and it's just, man, you're so tired, you can't just, there's no more energy in you, come to God. Lay it all at the feet of the cross. You know, the, the good old Baptist people would say that. Lay it all at the feet of the cross. I surrender all. Like, we sing that song in church, but that's a lie. We, that's probably the worst song that we can sing in church. I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender all. Like, that's not true. Have you? Have you surrendered all? Have you surrendered your life, your family, your finances, your circumstances, your marriage, your schooling? Have you? Because if you have, why are you worried? He's got it. He's God. There's nothing too hard for him. It's like no one can surprise God. Like, ha, got you. You ain't got no solution for that. You can't do that with God. You can't trick God. He knows. So let's just finish this. Um, the last few verses, verse 19, James says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's a formula right here. If you want to be patient, you want to be perfect, you want to be complete, the formula is hold your peace. I remember my, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, you have two ears and one mouth because you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. That's it, two ears, one mouth. If you want to be wise, hold your peace. The longer you hold your peace, the wiser you will become. I, I, I have this thing. Um, that I tell people. People don't like when I tell them that, but I say, look, I don't argue with stupid people. I, I don't. It's a waste of time. And when they go like, oh, I disagree. And I go like, that's okay. <laughs> I don't argue with stupid people. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm entitled to mine. And if we're healthy, we can have a healthy discussion. But if it's going to be back and forth and take us nowhere, I'm not doing that. Let me tell you a story. So before we finish this, uh, there's a story that obviously it's a, it's a kid's story that says this. Um, a donkey was having a very heated conversation with a tiger in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the forest. Forest, woods, you know, Australian people call it woods, America call it forest, whatever. So they were having a discussion and the donkey was saying, the sky is green. The sky is green. And the tiger was like, can't you see it? Are you so stupid? The sky is not green. The sky is blue. What are you talking about? And then they started calling in witnesses, like call the monkey, call the elephant, call everybody. It's like, what do you guys say? Is the sky blue or green? And the donkey insisted that the sky was green, but the tiger insisted that the sky was blue and nobody else was saying anything. They were just scared. Maybe scared of the donkey, scared of the tiger, we don't know, but they were scared. So they, someone had this brilliant idea. They said, take it to the king, ask the king, you know, the lion, the king of the jungle, lion king, I win my way, I win. we're not gonna go there, but anyway, ask the lion. So they take it to the palace in the jungle and they ask the lion. And they had this audience in front of him and then the tiger approaches his majesty and says, his majesty, I have a problem. The donkey is insisting that the sky is green. And we've had some discussions and this, it stirred up everyone in the forest. So the lion immediately stands up from his throne, calls the guard, the jungle guard, <laughs> and said, put the tiger in jail for five years. That's it. Everybody go home. So everyone was like, See what the lion did because you know we all know the sky is blue but you, wow maybe, maybe maybe he's tripping i don't know so what's what's going on there so they they have this brief moment the tiger says uh, permission to speak freely before i go to jail and then the lion grants him permission and he says look i i know you know the sky is blue so why am i going to jail and not the donkey and then 
the lion said to him, you're not going to jail because you're wrong. You're going to jail because you're spending your time arguing with an ass, <laughs> arguing with a donkey. It, uh, such a majestic creature like yourself wasting your time discussing with a donkey. That's why you're being punished. So you learn not to waste your time and my time with these stupid discussions. You want to be wise? Hold your peace. The wisest person in the room is always the last one to speak. Even if it's just to copy the other ones, <laughs> but at least you'll be the wisest. So he says this, uh, put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. What's the power of this thing is not that you become religious. The power of this thing is that it will save your soul. It will give you the wisdom to get out of those situations, but most importantly, it will make you see what you really need to see in life. The life is not just this. The life is not just material stuff, and it's not just 70 or 80 years that you live on earth, but that there is hope and there is eternity, and He's waiting for you there. He's made a way. All you got to do is cross that way. That's, that's what He did. And then, last but not least, He says, uh, Be doers of the word, not hearers. Jewish people would never, never accept someone saying that they are X if they don't do what X teaches. And I don't, I don't know how that works in our world because I'm pretty sure you have come across people who say they're Christians, but they don't really love their neighbors. Who say they're Christians, but they don't really treat their families well. Who say they're Christians, but they don't really go to work and do their best. Who say they're Christians, but they don't really live by what Jesus Christ teaches us. For a Jewish person, that's impossible. That's why James is so adamant in doing stuff. Because for a Hebrew, you are what you do. For a Greek, which is us, we're in the Western world. We learned a lot from Greek philosophy. So for us, we are what we say we are. We are our beliefs, okay? But for a Hebrew person, you are what you do. So don't come around. That's what James says. Don't come around telling me about your faith. Your faith means nothing if there's no works. It's dead. So you show me your faith with no works, which is impossible. And I'll show you my faith through my works. And then you'll see that I'm coherent. Cohesiveness. It's a value that the Jewish people valued a lot. If anyone thinks, the last verse, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he's going to talk about his tongue. Uh, about the time later on. His religion is worthless. Now the last verse. <laughs> religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this. Visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unstained. Now, for our modern day, I would say this. Specifically here in Australia, Gold Coast, we've had the rains. It's the same thing every summer. I could rephrase that. And, and use this sentence. The true religion is to visit the people who have lost their things while they're still going through the mess. That's, that's true religion. You go there and you say, what do you need? Oh, I need a new fridge. So you go out and buy a new fridge. But out of my own pocket, yes. Don't go back to church and say, hey, church, this guy needs this. No, if the need has come to you, it's because you're the answer. I used to have a friend that says, you know, generally, the answer to your question is in my pocket. But if you don't ask the questions, I can't give you the answer. So you, you have to ask the question. You have to put yourself out there. True religion is when you do things, not when you say you do things. But most importantly, when you remain unstained. That's the, that's the, the part that no one talks about it. You don't want to be stained with the worldly values that the world speaks. Like, you don't want to go visit people in their affliction and take a selfie to say you've done it. That's worldly. You go in there in secret and you make sure your left hand don't know what the right hand has done. And then you go back home and then you enjoy what our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. That most of the times, all the time, it is actually better to give than it is to receive. We are all going to go to trouble. We're all going to go through trials. Like I told you in the beginning, it's the only promise that Jesus had. Trials and tribulations. But be of good hope. Because I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. And if he's overcoming, he's coming back to rescue us. So we can live in that state of overcoming success. Maybe not now.
but it's coming. That's our faith. That's our hope. So if you're going through trouble, if you're going through trials right now, I can't do much because I'm on the other side of the screen. What I can offer is my encouragement to you. Remain there. Remain steadfast. Remain patient. Rely on the people around you. Open yourself up. Do it. Be a blessing even when you're being trialed because God is trusting you. And your test will surely become a testimony really soon to the people around you. I hope you've been inspired by this. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I really wish that God blesses you through the trials. And I'll see you on the next one. Peace.